because we're also we are seeing some movement on Russian assets. I believe at yeah. the moment, aren't we? Like this ongoing push to give the three hundred billion stored in Western banks to uh, uh, to Ukraine, um, which. It, it, regardless of whether you think it's kind of moral and fair because of Russia's invasion, and you can make that argument if you if you really want, um, it is entirely without precedent, um, and it, it will have, if it goes ahead, potentially massive repercussions for the US and uh, as the as capitalism's global regulator but also uh, for the Western financial institutions involved in um, uh, handing this money over Alex the floor is yours so yeah we see a lot of movement happening at the moment on uh, the attempts to um, take the already seized Russian assets and repurpose them towards uh, the Ukrainian military slash government if there is much of one left. Um, I guess that could be said for both of them. Yes, yes. Uh, so one thing I, I actually hadn't realized until uh, doing a bit of research for this episode is that the um, the bill for um, for the Ukraine aid that just passed the sixty one billion yes. uh, is actually nicknamed the Repo Act. <laughs> um, Brilliant. And basically, what it does is it. I mean, in addition to giving the $61 billion, it, it pay, this is according to the Atlantic Council, in the words of the Atlantic Council, uh, the unofficial think tank of NATO. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, the it's way, official. It's very much official. Well, may, may, maybe. I'm, I'm not quite sure about that. But uh, it paves the way for the seizures of uh, Russian central bank holdings that have been frozen in the United States for more than two years, while also setting the stage for a more global approach to confiscating Russian assets. Uh, Western countries froze approximately 300 billion Russian assets following the onset of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. I love that, you know, all this time later, they're still going with the term full-scale invasion when it's so obvious that that's not what happened. Um, yes. Well, I mean... The, uh, the Kremlin has been unable to access these funds since... Uh, but they are still te- they still technically belong to Russia. The Repo Act could now make it possible to seize Russian assets and use them for the benefit of Ukraine. Only five billion of the overall three hundred billion is located in the United States. But the United States is setting an important precedent by taking a leadership position in the confiscation of Russian state funds. We should not expect any immediate action. The Repo Act obliges the White House and U.S. Treasury Department to identify Russian assets in the U.S. within a 90-day period and report back to Congress in 180 days. After a further month, the president is then authorized to seize, confiscate, transfer, or vest any Russian state sovereign assets located within the United States. So I think this is, uh, as the Atlantic Council pointed out, an uh, underexamined aspect of um, – of this Ukraine aid bill. Um, and I also think that like it's it's pretty silly because I think that uh, when you take people that are, for lack of a better term, members of the oligarchy, mm. uh, and then you start seizing their assets over, I mean, they, they don't have a national allegiance really no. to, to Russia, they never have. No. Um, these people, regardless of where they're from, tend to be uh, only motivated by the by profit. And so, when you start seizing their money over geopolitics, uh, that I mean, if I were in that situation, I would start uh, being a lot more invested in the um, in the in the, the strength of Russia rather yeah. than the strength of. Um, my, well, I mean, my... one of the one of the ironies of this is that. Some oligarchs have, because when you're rich, you have uh, certain freedoms that poor people don't, um, have managed to get their assets f- uh, f- out of where they were stored yeah. and move them back to Russia. Um, this this is after Putin spending 20 years demanding oligarchs invest their money in Russia and not abroad and then refusing. So this is another hilarious boomerang of the, uh, the Western sanctions on Russia, yeah. which far from making the ruble rubble, as Biden um, boasted has um, resulted in in Russia being the biggest economy in Europe. Um, internal investment is at record highs, yeah, because of all of this net new yeah. money that's like sloshing around. Um, and I think as well that it is it has sent a very clear message to 
um, Rus- Russian elites that yes, that they are not welcome yeah. um, in the West. But more generally, I mean, you, you mentioned that this sets a, the US sets an important precedent. I mean, it does set set a very clear precedent, which is it is possible for hegemons to willfully commit suicide. Sure, yeah. right, because the the way that this will be perceived by the uh, the, the world's what top one percent is well if the US for whatever reason turns against my country or indeed my government does something that the US doesn't like yeah. they're going to to steal my money right and so while it's not uh, it, it won't be easy they will be looking for alternative means of storing their right. wealth and alternative um venues for storing their wealth um, Russia and China are moving towards creating a parallel um uh, international financial well, system, it, it, and, they're, and they're moving very quickly on that. Yeah, um, and Putin and, articulated that uh, in his interview with Tucker Carlson, just talking about the amount of foreign trades that were conducted previously to the sanctions um, in in dollars. Uh, I think it, he said down eighty percent or something like that. Don't quote me on that, but it, yeah. it's. Uh, the, the clip, the clips huge, around. The thing is huge. And now, and now, huge. there's been like a forty percent increase in in uh, trading in, in Chinese currency. So, oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, also, you know, we have uh, simultaneous to the Repo Act um, mo- paving the way towards the seizure of Russian assets. We have the European Union. Um, this is another Atlantic Council article. Uh, the European Union has made progress on its conservative plan to tap into the interest income. Uh, but its own estimates say this will provide about $3.5 billion a year. However, Ukraine needs are much greater. The first tranches of the Ukraine facility, facility platform agreed to by the EU, the $7.9 billion direct financial aid planned in the supplemental and aid from other supporters, all combined to provide enough for 2024. But what Kiev cannot afford to again face uh, is to again face cash flows similar to what it endured earlier this year um yeah well i mean there's there's talk of major financial institutions demanding ukraine hand over um <clears throat> and start repaying its, its debts to them which might actually account for why they're, they're unfreezing it now mm. because it, it's uh it's a means of pimco and blackrock getting their hands on ever more money yeah um, rather than any concern whatsoever for um for ukraine um i mean pretty it's pretty again money laundering operation as with as we discussed last week about the aid um it's yeah it, it, we we are on the precipice of the u.s doing something deeply destructive and, yeah. and uh, counterproductive uh, and I mean, as if the sanctions weren't already, you know, uh, 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 sufficiently seppuku esque. Um, so I mean, it, it 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 will be interesting to see how this plays out. I mean, again, much like the war itself, uh, <clears throat> the collapse is going to come gradually, then rapidly. And yeah. I think we've been kind of building towards that point for this this whole time, um, and then it will, it will start cascading quite soon. Yeah. Um, in, uh, uh, I'll play the uh, Christia Freeland clip. Please do. Um, so this is Christa, Christia Freeland, uh, the granddaughter of a Nazi, a Nazi collaborator who um, is well known for having attempted to whitewash that history. Uh, her grandfather, of course, fought against Russia in World War II. Um, and she is the uh, finance minister and vice prime minister or something like that in Canada. Uh, so very powerful official. Uh, I, th- I think that it's generally accepted that it's not Trudeau running the show and it's it's actually her yeah interesting. Um, and I here she shared that Nazi in the parliament but no. right right um so here she is talking about uh attempts to make uh Russia pay for the war in Ukraine let me just turn the Ending our own domestic legislative framework to allow the confiscation and the seizure of Russian assets. Lloyd has pointed to that. I'm glad we've done it. And I would urge all of us 
to get our legal frameworks in place. Um, I think we've seen some real progress there with the U in the U.S. And I do want to recognize the role that Lloyd has played, the role that Alan Rock, a Canadian former justice minister, has played, the role that um, Senator Ratna Omidvar, that's like our House of Lords, we have a Senate. Um, she has been playing a really leading role here, the role that Fenn osler Hampson has been playing. We have a real kind of... Um, a real team um, that has been working on this. Um, and I do want to also talk about Chatham House has been playing a leading role. I do want to say Philip Selico, Bob Selick, and Larry Summers have. Larry Summers being uh, the U.S. economist uh, largely responsible for the plundering of, of Russia in the 90s, um, good friend of Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, and an advocate of polluting uh, Africa. He's argued that it's um, it makes financial sense for the U.S. to dump toxic waste in Africa. So, and, and, and I'm doing some important up, work in laying the uh, Freeland um, says that there will be more movement <clears throat> on on the seizure of Russian assets uh, at the G7 summit. Look forward to it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just think that the, 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 it's one of those, I think you had a great phrase the other day, which is uh, death by a thousand self-inflicted cuts. Mm. Um, and I think that this, that this is going to be a very, very, very big self-inflicted self -inflicted cut. But it's one of those indications that the empire is just kind of, it's, it's on its last legs. It's quite drunk. Um, yeah. It's kind of looking, looking back on its life and singing, I did it my way. Yeah, uh, like you know, in the manner of Frank Sinatra, but you see all of these absolutely incredible uh, developments in the news, um, like recently. So uh, there, there are Russian troops that are now uh, have moved into a a base housing uh, primarily U.S. soldiers in Niger. Um, yeah, I think it was about a thousand U.S. soldiers um, under strict government orders left the country, and then they got replaced by Russian soldiers. So the Russian and U.S. forces are now sharing the same facilities. Yeah, uh, for the time being, until the, time the being. until they're kicked out. Yeah, yeah. So that I mean, that in itself is uh, is really quite remarkable. Um, we have had. Um, uh, the, uh, reports in the Jerusalem Post that the much vaunted U.S. Patriot intercept, uh, missile interceptors uh, in based in Israel only stopped uh, twenty five percent mm. of the, what Iran fired uh, at, uh, at Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even if that figure is, I mean, that, it's doubtful that figure is even true. Right, it could be considerably more. Um, there, there is uh, a lot of talk um, in the media about how. Uh, the, well, the, the, US, the, there's a, there's a double-edged sword when they, when they talk about, um, and you see this with Ukraine when they talk about the effectiveness of of Western supplied weaponry, um, because if they underplay it, they can make the argument that uh, it's not effective, and that's why we need to give more money. And if they overplay it, well, that's an obvious. Propaganda win and, and and probably a boost to uh, you know um, Lockheed stocks. You know. Yeah, yeah. I so mean, it's, it's also it's I mean it's also a way of um, explaining the the crushing uh, impending defeat. Um, could you draw up the the Telegraph article at the bottom of this section, in which a Ukrainian military intelligence chief. I think it's military intelligence. Uh, yeah, uh, Telegraph. Yeah, yeah. This is Ukraine peace talks. Yeah. So uh, Major General Vadim Skibitsky, the deputy head of Ukraine's military intelligence agency, um, said there is no way to win on the battlefield alone. Um, this is going to end in negotiations, and Ukraine isn't getting the territory it's lost back ever, uh, which is a pretty astonishing acknowledgement. Um, you know, I, it, it, it brings me no joy to have said this from the very beginning. Um, at all, uh, and uh, Mr. Sabitsky states wars can only end with treaties. Um, I mean, I, I thought last last summer we were told it was a beach party in Crimea, but no, yeah. this is a, actually the signing of a any a any treaty. day now. Yeah, I, th I think this August is the deadline. If not, parties cancelled. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, but you know, d um, d don't don't be overly cynical because because you know they've just got on that aid. So right, I'm sure right. going to tip them over the edge. But but so yeah, and um, we also see that there has been a, a number of articles um, that there was a, a, a particularly interesting piece in Business Insider where it was an interview with a US soldier 
who uh, fought in Ukraine from the start of this until the end of last year, who stated that his training um, in the US military did not actually prepare him for war at all. Um, and the US has forgotten how to actually fight wars because it has been focused on counterinsurgencies against quote unquote guerrillas, and which is to say uh, people in typically in the Middle East and North Africa who take up AK-47s because they don't want the US there. Yeah. Um, that's been the strategy. Well, well we, saw, we saw that in the beginning of the war when you had all these, uh, you know, um, US, Australian, British, French foreign fighters pouring into Ukraine and, and running their, <laughs> and running running away with their tail between their legs because they've you know their mental version of warfare was bombing defenseless farmers you yes, know yes indeed, so indeed. That, that, I mean there was there was that video that emerged at the very start um of the um, of the war in Ukraine it was like a US military vet who was saying yeah, like we didn't know we wouldn't have air cover. We didn't yeah. know that that we that we would be up against an enemy that actually had you know sophisticated artillery, right? Um, that was, air superiority, yeah, and and, and, and and air superiority, and that that, yeah. was, that was striking us with, with without us getting anywhere near them. Yeah. Um. So there's the yes, this is all. It all seems to be coming to a head, doesn't it? Yeah. 